All right, Luke chapter 4, if you have your Bibles, please turn there. Luke chapter 4. Amen. Beginning with verse 1, Luke 4 and 1. We're going to be teaching maybe two, three, two or three lessons on this uh, particular thought. We're going to title it Desert Dwellers. Desert Dwellers. Okay? So if you'll look in Luke chapter 4, please, verse 1. And Jesus, being full of the Holy Ghost, returned from Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness. Now notice it doesn't say he was led by the devil. He was led by the Spirit where? Why into the wilderness? Led by the Spirit, that's the Spirit of God, into the wilderness, being forty days tempted of the devil, and in those days he did eat nothing, and when they were ended, he afterward hungered. And the devil said unto him, If thou be the Son of God, command these stones, that it be made bread. Jesus answered him, saying, It is written that man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. And the devil, taking him up into a high mountain, showed unto him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. And the devil said unto him, All this power will I give thee, and the glory of them, for that is delivered unto me, and to whomsoever I will, I give it. If thou therefore will worship me, all shall be thine. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Get thee behind me, Satan, for it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. And he brought him to Jerusalem, and set him on the pinnacle of the temple, and said unto him, If thou be the Son of God, cast thyself down from hence. For it is written, He shall give His angels charge over thee to keep thee, and in their hands they shall bear thee up, lest at any time thou dash thy foot against a stone. Jesus answering said unto him, It is said, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. And when the devil had ended all the temptation, he departed from him for a season. Jesus returned in the power of the Spirit into Galilee, and there went out a fame of him through all the region round about. Let's pray. Father God, we come before you right now. We give you all praise and glory and honor. And thank you for this opportunity to be here in Jesus' mighty name. We pray. Amen. You may be seated in the name of the Lord. So the title of the message is going to be Desert Dwellers, What's Wrong With Me? What is wrong with me? So we're going to get into counseling again. We're getting into practical things this morning. All right. We went away from that temporarily to talk about modern day technology, etc. last Sunday morning. And then Wednesday we talked about technology again. The Wednesday before we talked about the New Age movement. Before that we talked about neurotic cycles. So now we're going back into the practical application of the scripture this morning. And we're going to try to find out what's wrong with us. But not just what's wrong with us, but how can we fix it? Okay. I will begin to say by this uh, opening statement that everything is not spiritual. I'll give you an example. There was a pastor who went into a veteran's hospital. And when he went in there, he went into the psych ward. Yeah. So he has a certain mentality of how to deal with people's problems and, and what's wrong with them, right, as a pastor, spiritual. So he goes into this veteran's hospital in a psych ward. And, and when he gets there, this man that is there begins to talk to somebody that wasn't there. So obviously there was some kind of psychosis that was going on there. And what that means, a psychosis is somebody that doesn't live in reality. Okay, we talked about neurotic things, but psychosis is when you're not living in reality. That means you have hallucinations. You see things that are not there. You talk to people that are not there. Okay, 
So this, ho- this man goes into the veteran's hospital and he goes into the psychiatric aspect there and he, and he walks in there and this man that is sitting there begins to talk to somebody that is not there. He watches it for a while and, and all he can think about is he's drawn upon as he's trying to figure out what's happening here. He's, he makes a, a decision that the man's dealing with demonic spirits. Okay? Um, and so what he does, he begins to try to cast those spirits out. These demonic spirits out of this man. As he's doing that, the staff of the hospital runs into the room to try to find out what is the chaos, what is the commotion here, what's going on in here. I mean, you can imagine what it'd be like, this man trying to cast these spirits out and no telling what that other man was doing. So the staff goes in there and trying to figure out what is wrong here. Goes in there and this thing is still just out of, it's just completely out of control. To make a long story short, this man wasn't dealing with demonic spirits. There were other issues in his life that he was dealing with that were not demonic spirits. But from the perspective of the pastor, he thought this man's psychosis, this man talking to somebody that wasn't there, had to be a demonic spirit. Well, what did the the staff do? They ushered him out of the hospital. They shut the, the hospital completely down. So that a pastor, a minister could never go back to that veteran's hospital anymore. Because he did not handle it correctly. My point is this, is that not everything that we face in life is a demonic spirit. And we'll talk about demons in a moment. But if you have this idea that everything, every problem that you have is a demonic spirit. Now, I also want to tell you demons are real. They are very real. But every problem is not a demonic spirit. Okay, amen. And the pastor was preoccupied with demons. And church people can get preoccupied with demons. And and I'll refer to it in just a moment as I go through step by step. Uh, A lot of times people would be glad if what they were dealing with was a demon. And you say, how is it possible that somebody would be glad or happy if they were dealing with a demonic spirit in their life? Because if it's a demonic spirit, you get prayed for, the spirit leaves and your problems leave and and everything's okay with you, right? But if it's not a demon that you can cast out, you're left with a long path, a long journey if it's organic. All right? Now, I'm not saying that anybody would want a demon. But it's a lot easier to cast a demon out than to deal with the things in your life that you need to deal with. So not everything is a demonic spirit. So they ushered that minister out of that hospital. They shut the hospital out for ministers. They could no longer go there anymore because of the way that preacher handled the situation. Amen? And so anyway, I will just tell you... We have taught you about demonic spirits. We've taught you about how they manifest themselves, how you can tell if you've got a demonic spirit. We've gone through all that process. We prayed with many of you to be delivered from a demonic spirit, so we know that spirits are real. But after you get through casting them all out, and the person hasn't changed, and the problem is still there, that should tell you that it wasn't a demon. There was something organically wrong in that person. Amen. And we'll talk about those this morning. So I hope this helps you. because And, and I know the Western culture doesn't really acknowledge a lot of times demonic spirits. But I think the church does. And we overemphasize demons to the point of losing focus upon God. To the point, if we're not careful, even the church... We live in fear of demons. There is no place in the Bible where it ever tells you to ever fear the devil or to ever feel a demonic spirit. So we shouldn't be preoccupied with demonic spirits. And if you're a new convert, you shouldn't be studying demonology. Because you're not ready for it. We should be focused on God and it's light that will cast out darkness. 
And if somebody really has a demonic spirit, you're going to know it. Because it's going to manifest itself. You don't have to guess at it, try to figure out. It will manifest itself if it's a demonic spirit. Amen? So I'm not discounting the demon spirits, but I don't want to be like that pastor who sees a devil behind every rock and under around every corner, you know, and gets so preoccupied with demons that I'm more preoccupied with demons than I am God. A lot of times, you remember that, that, that uh, was it a, a comedian? Every time he did something wrong, he said, the devil made me do it. Right? Wouldn't that be wonderful if everything, every time you did something wrong, you could always blame the devil? You say, the devil made me do it. And then we could just come and cast the devil out of you, and you would be completely well. And Yeah, so this, a lot of times for people, it's a cop-out. Because they would love for it to be a demonic spirit so they could get prayed for and get delivered and now all their problems have gone away and they don't want to deal with themselves. But the devil doesn't make you do everything. Flip Wilson was wrong when he said the devil made me do it. You know, I'm not going to talk about Flip Wilson too much this morning, but he talked about a pastor's wife. And, uh, you know, she's walking by a store and She's resisting the temptations, you know, to go in that store and buy some shoes or something, right? And the devil kept talking to her, you need to go in there and buy some shoes. <laughs> and he was mimic- mimicking that lady. He said, you know, she said, get thee behind me, devil. <laughs> I'm not going in there. Get thee behind me, devil. You know, but guess what? She went in there. Okay. She bought the shoes, went home and, and told her husband, the devil made me do it. The devil wasn't anywhere around, brothers and sisters. Amen. Come on. So we can't blame the devil for everything because a lot of times it's a cop-out. I guarantee you, if there's a real spirit, it will manifest itself. Amen. So anyway, we're going to talk about some other things. When we talk about desert dwellers, what's wrong with me? Let me explain to you where I'm going here. In the 300s, there were a group of people that were called desert dwellers. And it was during the time of Constantine. How many of y'all ever heard of Constantine? Under Constantine, a universal church was established. And persecution went away from the church. So the church was now recognized by the state. We call it the state religion. It was the legal church, the universal church, all right? And if you were a part of Constantine's universal church, you would have privileges. You would have status. You would get prosperity. It's sort of like the mega church of our day. That if you join that mega church, a lot you listen, I'm I know what I'm talking about. There's a lot of people who have influence, they have position, they have money, they have businesses, and a lot of them go to these big mega churches. You know why? It's for influence, it's for position, recognition, prosperity. So it's, it's been around a long time. And if you join Constantine's church, amen. Now if it's a Bible preaching church and it's a large church, a mega church, praise God for that, right? But I'm, not, I'm talking about the worldly church. I'm talking about the church that has the mentality that you are a little God. Amen. And that if you, if you just have enough faith, you'll never have any problems in your life. But anyway, Constantine had this mega church in his day. It's the legalized church. It's the recognized church by the state. And if you became a part of that church, then you got prosperity. You got influence. You got popularity. But what happened is nominal Christians filled that church. And what that means is that they were Christians in name only. I mean, pagans came into the church. They could still worship idols and come into the church, this church, and they would pray to these idols, you know, which in the past were idols, but they just called them saints. Right, right. Right. So you'd walk into these, these pagan temples and you would see these idols in the pagan temples, and, and those were idols of false gods. And what they did was they just called those false gods by the name of a saint. And they would pray to those saints. 
And so a lot of, in, a, in that early, three, in those 300s, those people feel the church because now it's popular to be a Christian. It's not only popular, it's going to bring you some advantage. And as a result of that, so-called nominal Christians were in that church. They really weren't born again. They really weren't saved. They were just religious, and they still held on to a lot of their paganism. Okay, amen? I'm going to say it again. It's sort of like the mega churches of today. That the, a lot of those churches don't have really genuinely born again people in them. They've got nominal Christians. They're not really born again. Amen. Okay. But there was a group of people. They were called the desert dwellers. And they saw how sick the church had become. Because of these people that have come into the church that weren't really born again. The church has lost its power. It's lost its, 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 it's just sick, you know. And so there were people that saw this in that church, in that worldly church, right? That popular church, that legalized church, if you will. And so as a result of that, there were people that really did love God. And it wasn't that they were disillusioned with God. They were disillusioned with the church. And they decided to leave the church, and to go to the desert. They were called desert dwellers. And the reason why they did that was because, listen, to do that meant that they had to take up their cross and follow Jesus. And it would go against the religion of their day. They would lose everything. But they would go out there and take up their cross because they loved God so much. And what they saw in that in that church that it wasn't right. They said, we don't want to be a part of this. It's sick. It doesn't have God in it, you know. So they went out into the desert. And it wasn't, listen to me carefully. They didn't go there in the 300s to escape. They didn't go there for that reason. They went into the deserts of Egypt. They went into the deserts of Syria. They went into the deserts of Palestine. They, they journeyed along the Nile River. But they did not do that. Go to the wilderness to escape anything. They went to the wilderness to go into spiritual battle. Just like Jesus in the fourth chapter. When he went into the wilderness, he took the battle to the devil. When they went, they weren't trying to escape anything. What they did was they're saying, we're going to the front lines of battle. And we're going to conquer the enemy. Amen. We're going to reject the worldly religion. And we're going to take up our cross because we love God so much. We're going to leave all of that. And we're going to literally go into the wilderness. Where the bat- where, as we see here in the fourth chapter of Luke, where Jesus went, he took the battle to the devil. So they recognized it wasn't a place of escape. It was a place where you were going to go and fight the spiritual battle. It was going to be a place where that's where the front lines were in their minds. We're going to go out there and we're going to fight this spiritual battle. But with a purpose. And that purpose was to bring in a new creation. And to get rid of the old creation, the old fallen creation. And to bring a new creation in, right? So they went out there and they lived in abandoned caves and they lived in abandoned forts and they lived on mountains and they lived in the tombs and and they served God. And and sometimes they did it by themselves and sometimes they did it in communities, you know. But they were trying to escape the fallenness and trying to establish the kingdom of God in the earth. And when they went out there, they focused on their need for God. Some people called them monks, these desert dwellers. And we think about monks and we think, wow, you know, I'm not not so sure about that. But those early monks were made up of camel traders. They were, those desert dwellers, if you will, were made up of poor people, shepherds, illiterate people, people that weren't educated. Are you hearing what I'm saying to you today? Yeah, they were those desert dwellers were made up of former slaves and former prostitutes and I'm saying former brother and sister that had been converted to Jesus Christ and their life had been changed 
And they loved God. And so they left society not to escape, but to go out and love God and take up their cross and deny themselves. And because they loved God so much, you can literally, you could find the, the, the burial places of all these desert dwellers. They loved God so much they were willing to leave it all. To seek to establish the kingdom of God in the earth. You with me to understand? And when they went out in the wilderness, the way they dealt with themselves, because ultimately that's what their focus was, was their own heart. They recognized that what was wrong with them was them. They, didn't, they weren't preoccupied with demons, but they knew when they went into the wilderness that that was a front line of spiritual warfare. But to them, spiritual warfare wasn't casting a demon out. It was dealing with their own heart. And their need to love God more. And so they went out there and they lived what was called ascetic lifestyles. Very strict, very disciplined lifestyles uh, with, with a lot of prayer and a lot of fasting. Amen. They would try to discipline their bodies. And it, it wasn't because they were trying to work for salvation. It was because they loved God. Hear what I'm saying. One writer said it this way. Who was an ascetic individual in those days. Uh, he made a statement. He said effort. Grace doesn't oppose effort. But it opposes merit. So when they went out and they lived for God and they literally, literally they died to themselves and, and they, decide, they desired to draw close to God and to love God and, and lay down their lives to serve God. Are you understanding what I'm trying to say to you? Amen. They saw that the problem was in their heart and that they were disobedient to God. And so they went into the wilderness of the desert to conquer themselves. To be victorious over their own passions. To be uh, 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 victorious over their own disobedience in their life. That's what they focused on. And so they would pray and they would fast oftentimes many days. Trying to get control. Trying to get discipline. Trying to get the victories over themselves. They weren't focused on depression that they might have. They weren't focused on gloom that they might have. They were focused on the need for a heart change. And so they would fast and they would pray not to get merit, not to get approved by God, but because they loved God. And they knew if I fast enough, that would cause me. They, listen, their concept of fasting was if I fast, it will cause me to love God more. If I pray, it will cause me to draw near to God more. You understand? That was their whole concept. It was all about how much they loved God. And they understood if they really did love God, they would put forth an effort to be victorious over their own passions, over their own desires, over their own disobedience. They didn't focus on depression. They didn't focus on gloom. They focused on their own need for God Almighty. And because they loved Him, they went into those caves. And because they loved Him, they went into those desert places and they served Him that way because they loved God. Amen. And as they went out there, they dealt with those passions. They dealt with their fallenness. And they didn't focus on past sins. They didn't focus on past failures. They focused on their present need for God. And they saw as they lived out there in those desert places, they drew near to God and, and, and sought to love Him more. They would go to the elders and they called their elders the Abbas, daddies. They would go to their fathers, their daddies, and, and they would ask them, What is the key to life? Tell me how to open my heart. And the Abba would tell them, the, the elder of the community would say, We need to love God. That's the answer for your problems. If you're trying to figure out what's wrong with you, what's wrong with me is I need to love God more. And it's not that our faith is a little gospel. The problem is we have too much of ourselves. Because if we could ever be like those desert dwellers that go out there and do whatever we got to do to love God and to get ourselves out of the way and deal with our heart issues and our disobedience before God, if we would be like them and we would learn to love God more, guess what? Most of our problems would go away. 
Say praise the Lord, church. What is the key to open my heart? What is the key to get victory in my life? Is to love God. Amen. Say praise the Lord. And so we see in the Bible, as you go through the Word of God, and I'm not going to get too heavy in that this morning, but you will see in the fall of the Garden of Eden, man was in paradise. And when sin entered into paradise, he was removed out of the garden, but not out of Eden. He was uh, taken out of the, the paradise of God, and he still lived in Eden on the outside of paradise. And so in a sense what happened was if you look in Genesis chapter 3 the Bible says the earth began to produce thorns and thistles etc. It became a wilderness because of the fall of man. It's no longer paradise. It's thorns and thistles. It's like a desert. It's like a wilderness because of the fall of man. And so these desert dwellers would go out into the desert to try to recapture a relationship with God and get victory over their own hearts and draw near to Him in the wilderness place. And that's why Jesus, when he came, if you think about it in the word of God, not only after the fall, we, we see the briars, the thorns, the stickers, etc. that came as a result of the fall, that desert, that wilderness. We see that when God got ready to redeem his people, he took them out of Egypt by the blood of a lamb and he led them through the wilderness. We see when Jesus came into the world before he went into the wilderness himself, the Bible said John the, John the Baptist, he's called. The Bible says John came out of the wilderness. A voice that came out of where? The wilderness. So to be a desert dweller, and I'm not saying to you today to pack up and go to the desert or the wilderness. I'm not telling you to go move in a cave somewhere or on a mountaintop somewhere. What I'm telling you spiritually is that what we need is more love for God. And if we love God the way that we should love God, it would take care of this heart. Galatians chapter 5 talks about the works of the flesh. Let's turn there, please. Galatians 5. I'm just letting the Lord lead me this morning. Praise God. Galatians 5, the Bible says this, Now the works, verse 19, of the flesh are manifest. That means... Uh, they're manifest. That means they can be seen. And what are they? Adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulation, wrath, strife, sedition, heresies, envies, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like, of the which I tell you before, as I've also told you in time past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, Faith, meekness, temperance against such there is no law. See, what God is showing you is that at the fall, another spirit, if you will, became a part of man. And man started acting like the devil. He was created in the image of God. He should have acted like God. But because of the fall, now he's starting to act like another father. He's acting like the devil. And all these things that Paul talks about in Galatians 5 is what you would find in the devil. But now they're inside of men. They're inside of women. And so these desert dwellers would go out there and they would understand that the problem was in the heart. And that's why they did what they did. Amen. It wasn't to escape. It was to deal with their passions. It was to overcome themselves. It was to be victorious so that they could walk with God the way they wanted to walk with God. And I'm telling you today, brothers and sisters, no, long, no matter how long you live for God, you still got a problem and it's you. And yes, we can blame the devil for this and blame the devil for that. And we can cast the devil out of your life. And we can pray over you all day and all night long and cast all these spirits out. But ultimately, we got a heart problem. So spiritually speaking, we need to be like those desert dwellers that go out and deal with the passions of our heart and look deep inside of us and say, God, because they did that every day of their life. It wasn't that they were preoccupied with their failure or sin, but they wanted to get rid of stuff that would hinder their relationship with God. And every day of their life, they repented. Say amen. amen. Some of them repented all the way to the death. Every day repenting of something. Say praise God. 
When John comes out of the wilderness, a voice coming out of the wilderness, he says, what? Repent. When Jesus starts preaching, he says, repent. And so that's what they did. One desert dweller, as he was on his deathbed and he was fixing to pass from this life, he looked at a younger believer. And he repented as he was fixing to leave this world. And he said to this younger believer, he said, continue what I have just begun to do. And he's fixing to die. What he's saying, I still haven't dealt with everything in me that needs to be dealt with. So you take up from where I live. Say, what I'm telling you, the spirit, but the decision, we have to have a desert dweller mentality. That means we love God so much, we're willing to take up our cross and follow Him and deny ourselves. Take the battle, hallelujah, to the forefront of our lives and experience death if necessary to whatever we need to experience because ultimately my problem and your problem is our heart. And so that's why they, they did what they did. Desert dwellers. You go through the Word of God and you'll see a howling wilderness is, an anti, is a picture, is opposite of paradise. And God has come to restore paradise back to this earth. And those desert dwellers, when they went out there in that wilderness, their, their desire was to say, you know what? This is a howling wilderness. This is what sin brought to the world. And we want to bring a new creation, a new person, a new, if you will, a new life. That's what they were after, brothers and sisters. Those people were so respected. I'm talking about those desert dwellers. Some of them called monks, if you will. When they walked in a, a, a room or whatever, they had tremendous respect from people that were there because those people saw the discipline that was in their life. Why? Because they loved God. That was their motive, brothers and sisters. Grace. It's not against effort. And we talk about the grace of God, and I believe in the grace of God, but a lot of people, you know, they go one side, and they all talk about grace, right, with no effort. Grace doesn't oppose effort. Grace opposes merit. Why am I doing what I'm doing? They didn't do it to get merit from God. They didn't get, do it to get approval from God. They did it because they loved God. And I'm telling you right now, brothers and sisters, what I'm preaching is so strange to the American church. It's so strange to people that go to church. Amen? Because if you go to some churches, you're a little God. And the foolishness that's preached there. And that's why the Bible tells us about how Jesus went in the wilderness and how John the Baptist went in the wilderness. Why? Because God is trying to restore paradise. He's trying to restore harmony. You with me right now, brother? Sister, think about it. When Adam and Eve, and, I, and I'm going to get into more of this as we go in the next few, few lessons. But think about it. Adam, when he walked into the garden, was full of the love of God. When he walked out, he was full of hate. Where did that come from? That came from that, that, the, the devil. The hate that's in the devil was now in the heart of man. He walked, out, he walked in full of the love of God. He walked out full of hate and envy and malice. He walked, out full, he walked in there full of truth. He walked out with a lie. He walked in that garden with the glory of God shining upon his face. And he walked out of that garden with bloody skins upon his body because of the fall that had taken place in that garden. He was in a paradise. He walked into a paradise. He was created outside of paradise. He was created in Eden. He was put in the garden of Eden. And Eve was came from his side in the Garden of Eden, but he was made outside of the Garden of Eden and put there by God. But when the devil came and tempted them, and they took the bait, they believed it. The lie, they believed it. And so now sin came into the world. That's where the problem is. And not only did it come into the world, but it came into the heart of men. It came into the heart of women. The same thing that was in the enemy was now inside of people. Think about what was lost. The love of God replaced by hate, malice, and envy. Think what was lost. 
a person walking in truth, but now walking in a lie. Think about what was lost, clothed with the glory of God, but now clothed with bloody skins. That all happened. And, it, and so what we see when Jesus goes to the wilderness, He's taking the battle to the enemy. He's seeking to restore what was lost in paradise in that howling wilderness, which is a picture of sin and a picture of death. And that's why those people did what they did, because they knew that the problem was with them. Right, right. Amen, that we've got to have victory over ourselves. Yes. How many of y'all love God this morning? I know you love God. You ask yourself, what's wrong with me? I'm telling you. Amen. Hallelujah. It's, it's something that's wrong with me. It's something that's wrong with you. We need a new nature. And once we get that new nature, the spirit of the living God, that God gives us the power to live for Him. But that day, day by day really is the mentality of the desert dwellers. I love God so much. That means I've got to be out here and I've got to die to some things and I've got to conquer some things and I've got some stuff inside of me. I've got a hell in wilderness on the inside of me. I'm dry. I'm dying. And so I'm trying to find, I need God. I want to love God more. Amen. Think about it, brothers and sisters, what they gave up. They gave up being accepted, they gave up being popular. They gave up being a part of the accepted megachurch. They gave it all up. They gave it. They went and said, why? Because I've got to take up my cross and follow Jesus Christ. Because I love Him that much. And I see inside of me. I'm not going to focus on my past failures. But I see inside of me enough today that I need to deal with that today. Why do I need to go back and talk about my past failures when I got enough today I need to deal with? You need to, get, you need to become a desert dweller in your mind, in your spirit. That means what's wrong with me today, God? I'm trusting you. I'm going to put forth some effort. And so they died out there, sometimes alone, sometimes in community. But they did it all because they love God. And I know a lot of you may not even know that about the monks or the desert dwellers. What motivated them. And sometimes people kind of make fun of them, you know. Because they were so ascetic. One student went to a man who was a very well known desert dweller. And he asked him a question. He said, I, he, this man said, I pray and I fast more than you do. See, his mind was on just prayer and fasting. You with me? But he wanted to talk to his teacher. And he said, hey, you're more popular than I am, but I pray and fast more than you do. How come you are more popular than me and I pray and fast more than you do? You with me? And that was saying something, by the way. The man he was talking to was very, very disciplined in prayer and fasting. Because he loved God. And so this man boasted about how much he prayed and fasted, you know, and how, how he crucified himself and all these things. He said to this other man, why are you more popular than me? Because I pray and fast more than you do. And the man gave him one answer. He said, I love God more than you do. Amen. That was a father. Amen. Hallelujah. Because they were known what they did, if they did it in the right motive, in the right spirit, they were known not just for what they did, but the spirit that they did it in. And it was for their, their love for God that caused them to do that. So yeah, you, you love God, but you don't love God like I love God. And you say, well, I don't know. I pray and fast more than you. That's got to be proof that I love God more than you. No. The man was known because he loved God. And what he did was because he loved God. I'm telling you, brother and sister, the greatest need that you and I have today is a love for God. Is a love for Jesus Christ. Say praise the Lord. And if I love him, I will keep his commandments. If I love him, I will put forth the necessary effort to make sure that I'm walking with this awesome God who deserves my life. 
Most churches you go to, they want to make you a little God. Most churches you go to, their focus is humanism. It's not God. It's how great you are. Live up to your potential. Your potential without God is a sinner. Without God, my... Oh, yeah, live up to your potential. Well, what are you talking about? With God or without God? Because if it's without God, I don't amount to much. But with God, you amount to something. Without God, you don't amount to much. Hallelujah. And God loves you so much that He came to give you a brand new spirit and a brand new life and give you power to be victorious over... What your problem is. Do we love God? Is ultimately the thing. And if we do, we'll deal with the disobedience that's in our life daily. He will feel the Holy Ghost this morning. If we love God, we will crucify that flesh. If we love God, we'll pray. If we love God, we'll fast. If we love God, we'll make our finance bow to God Almighty. If we love God, we'll serve God. If we love God, we'll put an effort. See, the way the American church today is this. You don't have to do anything. Just live up to your potential. Be all you can be. Without God, all you can be is a lost sinner. He said, but I tried, Pastor. I, you know, I've made New Year's resolutions and I've tried so hard to change and, and I can't change. And I just, I'm so tired of living this way. I was there. I was raised in church. And I knew the way I was living wasn't right. And so I tried to change myself. And I said, I'm not going to do this anymore, and I'm not going to do that anymore, and I'm going to, I'm going to make the change I need to make. And guess what? They went about for about a few days, and I flopped again. Until I got born again. I got filled with the Spirit of God and, and water baptized in Jesus' name. Had my sins washed away. And you know what's amazing? Because when I did that, those things I was struggling with went away. I got the victory over them. Because I got a brand new me. I got a brand new heart. I got a brand new spirit. I got a new name. I got a new life. Now I can live the way I'm supposed to live. What's wrong with me? I need more love for God. And less love for me. Because if I don't have enough of God in my heart. See the key is loving God. The key to open your heart is loving God. And if I don't have enough of the love of God in my heart, guess what that means? More hate's going to come out. More malice. More vengeance. More strife. All these things. And so that's why they went into that desert place. is to take the battle to the forefront in the wilderness. Say, Lord, we have a desire to establish a new way of living. We have a desire to establish the kingdom of God right here in this earth. And where man lost paradise, we're going out there to reclaim it. Give God praise in the house today. The love for God that was left, left in the garden and walked out full of hate. said, I'm going back for that. Say Amen. Look at your neighbor if your neighbor is not an angel, because if it's an angel, you can't see them. But look at your neighbor and tell them, I'm going to get back while I lost. I'm going back for love. I'm going back for truth. I'm going back for glory. Say praise God. Hallelujah. See, the gospel is big. It's powerful. It's plenty too much. The problem is, you're too big for the gospel. Come on, give God a hand clap of praise. I'm too big for the gospel. The gospel's really big enough. The gospel's not little. I'm just too big for the gospel. Hallelujah. Give God praise in the house today. Amen.
So this is sort of the direction we're going. I laid a foundation here where we're going. Amen. Amen. But let's just look at some manifestations of problems. Where they can come from. They ultimately come from the fall of man. Say amen. amen. Isn't God good? He's good. I want to try to help me. I need help. So when I preach to myself, you listen in and maybe it'll help you a little bit. <laughs> Hallelujah. What's wrong with me? I don't have enough love for God. Say praise the Lord. It's not always demonic spirits, brothers and sisters. That's my point, right? We know we're in a spiritual battle. Jesus took the battle to the enemy and and we'll get into this as we go further into it, maybe tonight. I don't know. We'll see what happens. We'll just let the Lord lead us. But, you know, after 40, the brain begins to deteriorate. Now, how many of y'all are over? You're over 40. Okay. So I'm just giving you good news this morning. Okay. After 40, your brain is deteriorating. And I'm not making this up, all right? I, I have advanced, advanced, oh, I, um, yeah, advanced certification in biblical counseling, which means absolutely nothing. Okay? So I'm not making this up as I go. But anyway, 40 years of age, when you turn 40, your brain is starting to deteriorate. Right? Now, some brother, Zachary, I think you're around, what, 27? You're fixing to be at the peak of your Humanness. Isn't that amazing? At 28 years of age, you are at the peak of your male humanity, if you're a male. Now, now, ladies, I'm going to give you a little more hope. The male peaks at 28. You peak, you get, come on, you with me? You don't start going downhill. You get a little bit more time than they do. The male starts going downhill around 28. From there, it's all down here. <laughs> and then when you turn 40, your brain is literally deteriorating. But a woman doesn't, are you with me? She doesn't peak at 28. She, it's, it's a little bit longer than the man. I don't know exactly what it is, hallelujah, but I'm just telling you, you're better than men most of the time. <laughs> and I know you've been told you are the problem. All your life you've been told you're the problem. Now, don't use this as a weapon. You know, don't go to, to, to whoever and say, you started going downhill at 28, and I'm, I'm still peaking. Hallelujah. All right? So sometimes our problems, brothers and sisters, is deal with the deterioration of our brains. Amen? Wow. Now, can you imagine what my brain looks like? Because I'm quite a bit older than 40. And if you, could, if you could take the top of my head off and look at my brain, it'd, it'd probably shock you. It's so deteriorated, hallelujah. <laughs> but I'm doing everything I can to try to keep it from getting deteriorated. Say amen. Praise the Lord, hallelujah. But I just want to give you the good news. Amen. So the next time you start having some problems and you think, what's wrong with me? If you're over 40, now I'll give you an excuse. You can tell whoever, you can say, well, my problem is my brain's deteriorating. Say amen. How many of y'all feel like that sometimes? Your brain, yeah, no, that's literally, that's the truth. Y'all all right out there? Amen. See, it's not always spiritual. Sometimes it's organic. Sometimes it's physical. I love it. Sometimes medications. Have you ever got on a medication and all of a sudden it starts affecting your thinking? Your psychology. Medications are strong. And new medications sometimes can cause you to act really different. So it's not always spiritual. It's on it maybe some medication you're on. Say so praise the Lord now. Now that don't mean if you're taking an aspirin, you walk into church and act up. And you can't walk into church and act up and say, Pastor, it's the aspirin I took this morning. I'm just telling you that sometimes. It's more than spiritual. New medications, all right? Powerful. They have powerful side effects. Yeah. That could be what's wrong with you today. 
if you're on some medications, they're putting you on some heavy side effects, man. Amen? What I would say is look at your life. And if you got on medications and all of a sudden it changed you in your thinking, changed you in your psyche, that's probably the answer. Right? You say, well, I'm, okay, look, first of all, look at your life and say, am I stressed about something? And if there's no stressor in your life right now, but you've just recently got on a new medication and you're acting crazy, it's probably the new medication. I'm trying to help you. Are y'all all right there? It could be that you may have had a history of substance abuse. That could be the problem, right? For example, you know, let's say you dealt with for, for a time in your life, and you know, thank God that you're not dealing with it today, and maybe you are dealing with it. I don't know. I'm not here to judge you. I'm not here to condemn you. I'm here to help you. But at some point in your life, you got into drugs, and those drugs have affected your mind, your psychology, brothers and sisters. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Now, there could be spirits involved with that. So if we cast that, if there is a spirit, if there's a spirit involved, and we cast that spirit out, and it's a spirit that's connected to drugs, then guess what? The drugs are going to go too. But, but, but sometimes it's just that, that you've had a history of drug addiction or substance abuse. It doesn't have to be like drugs. It could be alcohol. Yeah. Say amen, brothers and sisters. All right. How many of y'all out there have, don't lift your hands. Because I'd had, listen. I didn't get in the church till I was 18 years old. I'm 60 years old now. Okay? I didn't get in until I was 18. So that means that in my teenage years, I was acting up. And I was drinking and I was partying and all that stuff right now. And some of you say, well, that's what's wrong with you today. No, I'm... <laughs> no, I can't use that excuse. That's 40 years ago. But I want to tell you, it does, it does affect you, your mentality. Oh, hallelujah to the Lamb. Mm, help me, Jesus. Maybe there's a history of psychi- psychiatric disorders, right? That means you look at your life and you say, well, he's talking about psychiatric disorders. That's heavy stuff. De- depression is a psychiatric disorder. Maybe you've got a history of that in your life, right? You have to look at these things. The family history of brain disease. Look at at your family. Does your family have a history of brain disease? If it does, then there's genetics that are connected to that. I don't know if you know this today, brothers and sisters, but you might have a heart attack gene inside of you. There is a heart attack gene. Are you with me? Amen. There's high blood pressure genes. Right. Genetics came from mom and dad. And we're going to talk about prototype and genotype pretty soon. I'm going to explain prototype and genotype to you, what that means. But there are things that you inherited genetically that predispose you to major sickness and illness. They can literally look at your genome track, your DNA, and tell you if you've got a cancer gene or a heart attack gene, or a high blood pressure gene. So look at the history of your family. That's why you're into the doctor, and the doctor always wants to ask about mama, and always ask about daddy, and grandpa, and grandma. And I say, I don't want to talk about grandma, and grandpa, and daddy. I want to talk about me. Well, they do that for a reason, because they understand the history of disease. Praise the Lord. Not demons. Right? But let me talk about demons just for a moment. Another reason why you may be dealing with something that's that's wrong with you is because you've allowed yourself to get involved in the occult. Amen? Amen. Like what? How do you get involved in the occult? The occult deals with Satanism, right? There's people that dabble in Satanism, the occult. 
And I, when I talk about the occult, and you may have problems today because of the occult, you were involved in the occult in the past. I'm not necessarily saying that you're seeing the devil show up in your room. What I mean by that, if you're dealing with the problem in you today and you open yourself to the occult, that means this. At some point in your life, you asked darkness to come in. You invited darkness to come inside of you. If you did that, that's why you're having a problem today. Because you have opened yourself to the occult, to darkness, to come inside of you. So I would say look back in your life. Is there ever a point in your life where you dabbled in the occult? You know, Did you go to the bookstore and ask somebody uh, for the, the book of Satan? Or the Bible, Satanic Bible? If you've ever had a Satanic Bible in your possession and you've read, read the Satanic Bible... Or if you've been involved with Ouija boards. Or you've invited darkness to come inside of you. I didn't say a demon. I said darkness to come inside of you. Then that's occult. Amen. That could be your problem. Yeah, man, you'd be surprised. how If you go to a bookstore and you're in that bookstore, how many people go in there and looking for the Satanic Bible? Hallelujah. Now, hey, I'm dealing with real stuff this morning. I'm trying to help you. There was a young man years and years ago before we started, before I started pastoring. He was awesome. He got into church, got baptized, and he got filled with the Holy Ghost. He was on fire for God. So just a just a wonderful young man. And so I was working with him in those days, and I noticed one day that he was wearing a pentagram underneath his shirt. It was kind of a tight, it's black in color, and there's a pentagram under his shirt. Now, keep in mind, he had just gotten to church filled with the Holy Ghost, baptized in Jesus' name, but he's got a pentagram underneath his shirt. And I'm saying, what's going on here? He started reverting back. See, he was involved in the occult. You know what? what? I want you to hear what I'm about to tell you. You have to be careful with subtle things that come from the enemy. Things that are not apparently overtly bad. You have to be wise. Let me give you an example. This young man, now that he's got in the church, new convert, full of spirit, excited about God, you know what he does? He starts reading books on demonology. He wasn't ready for that. Because he had just come out of that lifestyle of the occult and now he's going back and he wants to look at it from a Christian perspective. And what happened was the enemy used that subtly to pull him back into what he was in before. Say praise the Lord, church. So if you've ever been involved in the occult, we can help you with that. We can pray with you and God can set you free from that darkness, etc. But a lot of people deal in the occult today. Have you ever dealt, in the old, dealt with the occult? Look at physical symptoms. Amen. Look at organ malfunctions. Look at slow speech. Look at slow thinking. Look at muscle coordination. Are y'all, are y'all getting this? Is something wrong with your taste? You got to keep this in mind. I'm talking about organic things. You have a feeling that something's not right, and you, you look at your your spouse or whatever you say. I just don't feel like it. Doesn't feel like something's off. It doesn't feel right in me. Something feels wrong. Brothers, sisters, take notice of that. It's important. Could be a health issue, physical symptoms, right? It could be just diet, could be sleep and exercise that you, you know. That could be it, brother and sister, hallelujah. So you come to church and you say, Pastor, cast that devil out of me. And I say, come here and do it. Oh. <laughs> we cast the devil out of you, right? And you're still the same. Then if you're still the same, after we try to cast the devil out of you, I would ask you three things. Number one, how much sleep do you get? could be just a practical thing. Hallelujah. See, let me tell you something, Brother Citrus. You can't sleep at church, uh, at, at home at, 
at night, so you come to church and listen to the pastor and they put your... <laughs> that might be all you need. Just get one of my tapes and put it in the, in the tape player and you, you go right to sleep. It's amazing how when I preach the Word of God, people that can't sleep can sleep like... Not like a baby because a baby doesn't sleep very well, but, you know, hallelujah. They just... <laughs> hallelujah, man. Say, so at least I'm doing some good for him. But here's what I want to tell you. Do you realize, and everyone you need to know this, if you've got teenage girls, teenage boys, whatever, right? They're supposed to get nine to ten hours of sleep. Not eight. Not six. Nine to ten hours of sleep if they're going to be healthy. Well, how many of y'all have noticed the light was still on under the door? Of their bedroom. And you walk in there, right? And they're saying, I'm doing my homework, Mom. Yes. Along with a lot of other devices you've got there, you know. You've got your cell phone. You've got your computer. You've got the movie going on over here in the corner. And you're doing the homework at the same time. You're not getting any sleep. Most teenagers sleep about six hours. And they're supposed to be getting nine to ten. And so you're walking around, what's wrong with, with her? What's wrong with him? You just go and see what time they go to bed at night. That could be all it is. They're not getting enough sleep. Brothers and sisters, you hear what I'm telling you? And if they don't get enough sleep, how many of you adults out there get enough sleep? You get four to six hours of sleep and no wonder you're like a zombie. Amen. Yeah, we need at least eight hours of sleep. Now, I know some people say, well, I don't, I, you know, I'm Donald Trump, and Donald Trump, he only needs four hours of sleep. Well, I'm not Donald Trump, and you're not Donald Trump. Hallelujah. So you need, look at this, I need to start getting some sleep. Amen. And your, your young people, you need to start making sure you're going to bed. I don't want to go to bed. You go to bed. Because you need, pastor said you need nine to ten hours of sleep. See, that's what you do, right? To get the monkey off of your back. Now you're going to tell it, pastor said this. That's all right, use me. I don't mind. Whatever helps you. But we don't get enough sleep. You know, you know well, I don't want to be lazy. You're not being lazy. You're getting proper rest. Next thing is Diet. Your problem might just simply be diet. Come on. You go to the store and you get a cup of coffee. And that cup of coffee has got 150 grams of sugar. And you wonder what's wrong with you. You all right? Amen. Amen. Say, praise the Lord, church. Don't shout me down because I'm preaching good. And I'm not saying you've got to eat a gourmet meal every day. It would be nice, wouldn't it? But focus on your nutrition. Because it could simply be nutritional problems with you. You don't eat right. Now see, now I'm meddling. And y'all are looking at me now. You're saying, stop meddling, Pastor. Leave my diet alone. No, we need to eat right. And it simply means this. You might not eat a gourmet meal all the time, but you have the ability to eat nutritional food. Say amen. Amen. Oh, hallelujah. Boy, I remember those days I was dealing with allergies real bad, and I'd love for somebody to be able to walk up and say, in the name of Jesus, I cast the spirit of allergies out. (laughs) I mean, I would have loved that. That means I get to keep eating, you know, whatever I want to eat. But there was no such thing as a spirit of allergies. Going to cast the allergy spirit out. No, I had to change my eating habits. You say, well, I'm trying to lose weight. Brothers and sisters, I didn't even try to lose weight. I was 30 pounds. Because I stopped eating lectin foods. I stopped eating sugar. I stopped eating breads most of the time. I mean, you know. I stopped eating french fried potatoes. You know, I eat french fried sweet potatoes now. You go, ugh. Yeah, I get it. 
But I, you know what? As soon as I started doing that, my allergy problems went away. I started feeling better. Hallelujah. Still fighting the devil, but I still feel better. I'm, I'm fighting the devil, but I, still, I feel better fighting the devil. Say amen. amen. Exercise. Exercise. When's the last time you exercised? Yesterday. Yesterday. Good. I'm not telling you you have to go get a gym membership. I have one, you know, and I do, and I do. Yeah, I'm, I do it. I got the discipline to do it. Thank God, right? You don't have to do that if you don't want to. But a 10-minute walk, just a 10-minute walk will, will stabilize your, your glucose and everything in your body. A 10-minute walk, just a fast-paced walk, 10 minutes. I'm not even telling you to do two miles. I'm not even telling you to do two hours. I'm just saying 10 minutes after each meal. That's all you got to do. And you would be shocked. Amen? And some of y'all say, I just got insomnia going back to the first one. I just have insomnia, Pastor. Cast the spirit of insomnia out of me. No, probably what you need is just a walk. So if you go on, take, take your kids on a walk. Your kids can't sleep. They got the, you know, the gadgets out and they can't sleep. And they say, I can't sleep. Well, just let's go for a walk. And a lot of times just a, a walk will get rid of the insomnia. Right? So you got to look at these things. Praise the Lord. Electronic media and devices, etc., etc., homework, entertainment, all these things play into it. That's, that's, maybe that's what the problem is. It's a simple thing, not a big, big deal. It's a, you know, we want to make everything a big deal. It could be simple things. Amen. But sometimes now we're going to get the spiritual intervention. We're going to deal with demons some, all right, because they're real. Talked about the occult just a little bit, etc. But I will tell you this, brothers and sisters. If you think it's a demonic spirit and you've prayed and maybe other people have prayed for you and they're, they, they're uh, skilled in deliverance and that didn't fix you, then there's another issue that you've got to look at. Okay, But let's just say that it's possible that it's a demonic spirit. Are you with me now? And again, I told you, a lot of people want demonic spirits. I know, I know that sounds crazy. But they do because it's a quick fix. Because they don't want to deal with themselves. They don't want to change. So we're going to blame it on the devil. Hallelujah. The devil made me do it. Let's look at some verses here and I'm going to let you go in just a moment. Thank you for being kind and listening to me this morning. I'm trying to give you some good news this morning. You're, you may not be quite as messed up as you think you are. You know? Matthew eleven eighteen. 18. Let's look at it. For John came neither eating nor drinking, and they say he hath a devil. How many of y'all ever heard of the term demon possession? It's not a biblical term. Demon possession. If, the, if you are demon-possessed, that, that means that you believe the devil owns you. And that means if you're owned by the devil, there's no hope for you to be delivered. But that's not biblical because the Bible doesn't use the term. Now, you may say, well, I can find it in the King James Version. But literally, the word possession, as you and I know it, doesn't mean possession. So I'm going to just say it this way. It, it, possession is not in your Bible. You may find the word, but it's not in your Bible. Because the devil doesn't own anybody. The devil doesn't own you. He doesn't own me. He doesn't possess anybody. Therefore, if you're dealing with demonic spirits, you can be set free. You can be delivered. And demonic spirits can be defeated. And you are not to fear them. You are not to walk in fear of them. Because the Bible doesn't tell you to fear them. Good news. You can be set free. You can be delivered from those demonic spirits. So the Bible uses the term here. Uh, they said that John had, he has a spirit. It's different from being possessed by one. Okay, you with me now? All right. Look at your neighbor and say, you can have a demon. When I'm a Christian, you still can. But you can't be possessed by the devil. 
2 Corinthians 10, let's go there. 2 Corinthians 10, 3 through 4. All right. We doing all right? For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. God is telling you that strongholds, demonic strongholds, can be brought down. They, ha- they can be defeated. James 4, 7. You can write these verses down if I'm going too fast. James 4, 7. Amen. I think you remember the verse... Submit yourself to God and resist the devil and he will flee from you. Amen. You're dealing with demonic spirits. Submit to God and resist the devil. Right? Verse 7. Submit yourself therefore to God. Resist the devil and he will what? He'll flee from you. He'll run from you. Literally, literally, he'll run from you like a scared rabbit. If you'll submit to God, but you need to resist him. Yes, they can be defeated. You say, well, I'm resisting the devil. But are you resisting the situations that you find yourself in? Are you resisting temptations? Everybody awake? See, to resist the devil doesn't just mean... That the devil's attacking you, so you're going to submit to God and you're going to resist him. Literally, it means that you're resisting temptations. You're resisting situations that, that you know will cause failure in your life. Yes. Say amen. amen. First Peter 5. Let's go there very quickly. It's very close to James. Thank God. You know, so we don't have too far to go. 1 Peter 5, 8, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour, whom resist steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. So when the, when the devil comes to you like a lion, what do you do? You resist him. We submit to God and we resist the enemy. That means there needs to be, if I'm resisting the enemy, that means I have to be disciplined. If I'm resisting the enemy, that means there has to be self-control in my life. If I'm resisting the enemy, that means that I, things I know that I'm tempted with, I have to resist those tempted situations I can find myself in. Hallelujah. I've got to resist being in those situations. Okay. Please forgive me. It's a little graphic. All right, I'm not trying to be, you know, disgusting this morning. But there was a young man when I was, had, had uh, my own business and had a young man working for me. And, you know, he, he was in the church and trying to live for the Lord. And, he, and I was his pastor as well. And he kept coming to me saying, Pastor, I'm struggling with this. And I'm struggling with that. And I'm struggling with this. And I can't overcome this. And, well, he wouldn't resist. And I told him, I said, you can't have a young girl in your bedroom without her clothes on and you go in there and expect to think that you're going to be able to overcome that. Does that make sense? Say amen. That means when you, you're saying you're having a trouble overcoming, well, you, you're bringing her into the bedroom. How can you overcome like that? Say amen. Man. So really, brothers, a lot of things are not a demonic spirit. They're just like, I need to resist things. Temptations, situations. We all do. Mm, the, The enemy is coming like a lion. With what? That temptation. With that situation. But the enemy can be defeated. Say, praise the Lord. I love it. Thank you, Jesus. 
I told somebody recently, I was trying to figure out what I wrote there, but I told somebody, a young person, this applies for all of us. I said, really, what it's about is making good decisions and good choices. You start out in the morning, you make good decisions and good choices. And all day long, if you make good decisions and good choices, at the end of the day, you're going to be where you want to be. It's not really that hard. But at some point in the day, if I give in to temptations, if I give in to situations, and I'm not resisting, and I don't have self-control in my life, at the end of the day, I'm not going to be where I want to be. And it's really not that hard for each and every one of us. You say, well, Pastor, I know you would. Brothers and sisters, we all have to resist. And that means whatever, whenever it comes, whatever time of the day, okay, I'm going to make the right decision, make the right choice. Because at the end of the day, I don't want to have any remorse. I don't want to carry any baggage. I don't want any remorse. I don't want any disappointment. I don't want any failure. And what will keep me from getting failure at the end of the day instead of victory is making the right choices and the right decisions all day long. So I'm submitting to God. And I'm resisting the devil. And I told this person, I said, you have to make room, though, for failure. Because if you fail, you need to know it's not over. If you fail, you come back to the house of God. You keep living for the Lord because even though you made a bad choice or a bad decision that caused the end of your day to not end the way you want it to, the good decision is I'm going back to the house of God. I'm going back to church. And I said to this person, I said, we love you. We're not condemning you. I'm not condemning you. I said, I'm still in your corner. And if you leave, if you leave your corner, I'm still going to be there. Because they were worried about what I thought about them. They were worried about what the church thought about them. I said, do not put value on anybody's opinion of you unless they have your best interest at heart. If they've got your best interest at heart, then value their opinion. And I said to this person, value your pastor's opinion. Value other people's opinion that love you and care about you, that have your best interest at heart. And everybody else, forget them. I said, just forget what they think. Because they're not important for you to value their opinion. I want God's favor. I want, I want people that love me and care about me and have my best interest at heart. I want their opinions. And those are important. But I said, you need to make room. If you come short, if you fail, you need to make room for that. Because then the enemy is going to come after you. He's going to hit you hard. Say, well, you tried. Just give up. No, make, make the good decision. Make the right decision. And I told this person, and I said, by the way, I know what you did. Okay. But you made the right decision today to call me. And the whole time I was on the phone, it was restoring. The whole time I was on the phone, uh, giving direction in that person's life to how they can walk beyond their failures. Amen. Giving them help to know if I make the right choice of the decisions during the day, at the end of the day, I'm going to have a victory one day at a time. I'm going to have another victory. Hallelujah. Don't make light of the victories that you got. Those small victories that you got. Thank God for the small victories that you have day by day. And if you fail, make another decision. Make another choice. And that's a good one. Hallelujah. And you'll find yourself where you want to be. At the end of the day. And not only at the end of the day, but the end of your life. You'll be in the new Jerusalem. You'll be with God Almighty in heaven. It's day by day. Give the Lord a hand clap of praise. There, there, there's some people I don't care what their opinions are of me. Because they don't have my, my best interest at heart anyway. Something else motivating them. You know. Hallelujah. But I told him, I said, if you think I'm not in your corner, you're wrong. 
I said, you might have walked out of that corner, but I'm still standing there. Amen, amen. And, and I told another person one long ago, I said, you know what? You can stand there and say you don't believe in God and you can reject that, reject the, all these things. And I said, but I'm going to tell you something. While you're standing there and you're looking at your pastor and you're looking at your mother and your father and you're saying that you don't believe in God. And I felt this in the spirit. And I said, while you're standing there rejecting him, or, den- or maybe not rejecting but denying him, mm-hmm. I said, he's standing right there in front of you, <clears throat> loving you. Yes. I said, he's, he's not going anywhere. Right. He's not going anywhere. You can say you don't believe in him. You can deny his existence. But guess what? He's still standing right there, right in Amen. front of you, loving you right now. He didn't walk away from you. Amen. You walk away from him, but he's not going to walk away from right. you. Right. Give God praise in the house. So that's how you resist and submit. Hallelujah. Making right choices, overcoming temptations, overcoming situations. Hallelujah to the Lamb. Okay. I'm almost done. Appreciate you. Look at your number and say, Demons are real. Then if they are, stay away from them. It's really not that hard. I'm not talking about your husband. Pastor told me I need to stay away from you. <laughs> stay away from them. It's not hard to be victorious. Just stay away from those devils. Stay away from those demons. Stay away from evil. Look at your neighbor and say, stay away from evil. Feel the Holy Ghost. Now, help me look at your neighbor and say, demons can be defeated. Wow. How many of y'all are afraid of devils? You're afraid of demons? Afraid of them? You shouldn't be. Shouldn't be. Hmm. Not too much emphasis on them. If you put it, if you focus on the God of this world, if you focus on demons all the time, you know what that's doing? You're not focusing on God. And if you focus on God, you'll be amazed at how much all that, all those demons, they, yeah. Because light expels darkness. And that's, that's what happened to, that's what, I, I, man, I'm, I know his name now. I could tell Brother Mark, you'd know him if I called him by name. I'm not going to because we're on YouTube here. It's going out all over the world. So I'm not going to do that to him. But that's what happened to him. He got in the church. He was, he was on fire, man. He was praying at every prayer meeting, fasting, seeking God. He started reading books on spiritual warfare. He started reading books on demonology from a Christian perspective. Amen. He started focusing on demons. And the darkness came in his soul. And he went back. He went back into that lifestyle. Because why? Because he was too preoccupied with demons. Focus on God. I'm, okay, I told you I'm almost done. I promise you. Stop putting so much emphasis on them. Number four, resist temptation. Resist temptation. Amen. Here's where we have a problem. All right, I'm trying to help us. Is we can look at a situation, we say, I've got it under control. Wow. Have you ever been in a situation that I've got it under control and you found out with time you didn't have it under control? Whew. Put you this way. A lot of times we say we might think, we might literally, legitimately think we have it under control. And we don't have it under control. So focus on God. Light expels darkness. All right? Very quickly. Last, I'm going to give you five things. I'm going to let you go. Strategies. Number one, know your enemy. Look at your enemy. Look, look, not your enemy. Hallelujah. Okay. Anyway. All right. 
Man, you can tell I'm all over the place, but that's okay. I'm trying to help you. Amen. Know your enemy. Okay, let, let me just kind of mellow it just a little bit. Let's get off the battlefield and let's get into the, to the, to the turf. Okay, all right. And I know y'all think I'm carnal and that's all right. I mean, judge me if you want to and already. But I like, I like football. Okay. okay. Oh, okay. I got another sinner in the house too. But, so I'm not the only sinner in the house. So, <laughs> but what team you like? Oh, well, yeah, see. Hallelujah. Oh, yeah, look at him going off now. Hallelujah. I'm creating division in the house of God. <laughs> yeah, right. Okay, we talk it up. We'll talk about it later. <laughs> but I'll get off the battlefield. I'm going to get on the turf just for a little bit, right? There was a well known quarterback. His name was Peyton Manning. Okay. There was a quarterback that was underneath him that watched him one night, one day play a game, and he called an audible. You know what an audible is, right, for all you you know football? An audible is when you change the play at the, at the line of scrimmage. So they've already, they've already called the play in the huddle, and the quarterback says he sees the defense. Okay? When he sees the defense, he calls an audible. That means he changes the play of the offense to match what the defense is showing him. Peyton Manning. They were watching film on Peyton Manning's game, and another quarterback, a younger quarterback underneath him, saw him call an audible. Changed the offensive play because of the defense. He asked Peyton Manning a question. He said, how did you know to change that play? He said, because I saw that defense on, in another play, uh, in another film 10 years ago. He was constantly studying the defenses. He watched film, literally thousands of hours of film. And he could go back 10 years where he saw a formation on a film. And he called an audible based on knowing the enemy. Praise the Lord, brothers and sisters. Hallelujah. See, there's some people that have been in the kingdom of God for a while. And I know you're the big man, you're the big guy, you're the big dude, you know, you're the... I get it. But there's been some people that have been in the kingdom of God a long time, and they watched the way the enemy works for a long time. Amen? And I thank God I've got him in my life. I've been in this 40 years, but I still need somebody sometime to talk to. Amen? Because, because there are things that come that are really, really, they're unique to me. Okay? So I thank God for those men. I, I called Brother Yates not long ago and talked to him about a situation. And he spoke, boy, God spoke through him. Then he prayed for me. Amen. 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 And then Brother Emma's from time to time we talk a lot too. You know, but I'm just saying that you have to know the enemy. Amen. And I'm not telling you to be preoccupied with it, but you've got to know the way he works. Right. Amen. Hallelujah. See, that's the difference between a successful quarterback and a not successful quarterback is they know the defenses. Amen. Amen. Number two, evil works best when it's subtle. Because, you know, if something is just overtly wrong and it comes to you and you know what's overtly wrong, I mean, yeah. You know it, right? But when things come in subtly, say hallelujah. hallelujah. For that young man I was talking about, when he picked up that, those books on spiritual warfare, okay, he started studying those. He didn't realize that that was a subtle approach from the enemy because it wasn't overtly wrong. But the enemy knew what would hook him and what would take him back to where he was before. You have to be careful of subtle things. I have to be careful of subtle things. Come on, church. Okay, I'm going there. So there's something going on in your home. It happens to all of us. Things happen in our home all the time. You're not getting the attention that you need to get at home. 
So here comes the enemy with a little subtle attention from somebody else. And that subtle attention that comes from somebody else, it's not overtly, it doesn't look wrong, doesn't look bad. But that could be the very subtle approach the enemy tries to get into your life. Amen. 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 Say praise God. I've told, I've told you women, young women, if you want to get married to somebody, smile. <laughs> because there's something about that. See, most men are never smiled at. They go home. Where you been? Who you been with? <laughs> what are you smile about? All right, listen to me. Amen. And that's what they get at home. And then all of a sudden, a little subtlety comes, and somebody smiles at him. They go, "Wow." Okay, say praise the Lord, church. I'm just being practical. Been there. Been there. Been there. Say, you're not talking. You're not saying anything right now. You've been there. I've been there. Woo, hallelujah. I was there yesterday. Tell me more. Tell me more. I went to Super Pollo to get some chicken. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> Say praise the Lord, church. Praise Super Lord. Pollo. Drove up there. There was a young lady there waiting on there, us at the window. Smiling so big. Say praise the Lord. I'm sorry. Yeah. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. And I know she didn't mean anything about it by it. You know, I know she didn't. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord, church. Yeah. I don't know. She, she might have been doing that because the, the time before, and Christine was with me, the time before I gave her a $4 tip. So that, that could be why it may not, you know. But, but she was smiling then too yeah. before I gave her the tip. So that, I have to put two and two together. That's, that's right. <sighs> Let me tell you, brothers and sisters, evil works better when it's subtle. It really does. Okay, say praise God. We we are human beings, man. That leads me to the third one, crossing lines. Okay? So, you ever been to a line and you knew it was a line? And you knew, oh, you shouldn't cross that line. You kept playing. Okay, man. Boy, you talk about, man, I'm laying it out there today. Yeah. I'm starting to get nervous. Okay, because we all at times can cross those lines, right? So, cross the line. Okay, cross the line. All right. Yes, sir. Now, once you cross that threshold, right. then the next threshold is going to be easier to cross that threshold. Yeah. And then the next threshold, it's easier to cross those thresholds. Right. Amen. 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 Amen? So, when you come up and you know there's a line there, right. don't cross it. Because when you cross that one, then the next one... Yeah, I've, I've been there. I've been there. Amen. I'll admit to you, I've been there. It's easy. Amen. And you know, you know, come on. Amen. 
Y'all awake up there? So what I'm saying is, step by step, we get to a place where we're hooked. It didn't happen overnight. It happened by crossing lines. A little bit here and a little bit there. Hallelujah. Come on, church. Hear what I'm telling you. Please hear what I'm telling you. Amen. How many of y'all can say amen to that? Amen. God is good. You know, most, most of our failures in life are not things that happen just like that. They happen because one step at a time led us there. And the only thing I can tell you, brothers and sisters, is we got to be desert dwellers. Every one of us. Okay? Because there's things inside of us. Passions. There are things inside of us. Disobediences. There are things inside of us that have to be dealt with. The heart is the problem. Amen? Amen. Praise the Lord! I told somebody one time, I said, now, as a woman, you be careful. Because when you smile, they misinterpreting you. That's right. Amen. And, and I know you, you may not in, have an intention or anything, That's right. but it's not always about your intention. That's right. And it's not about what you can control. It's about what they can That's control. Right. So, you, you know, you smile too much, right. and they can interpret that. A man can interpret that wrong. And you didn't intend it that way. That's right. So hallelujah. Praise God. Praise God. Okay, that's, that's true. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I got a few people saying amen out there, but not too many. Yeah. Say hallelujah. hallelujah. I mean, think about it. That's right. Got a man goes home, all he's got is the man at the door, a lady with rollers in her hair made out of <laughs> made out of water hose. And, Got a rolling pin in her hand. My goodness. And you wonder what the problem is? I'm not making an excuse for any failure that that man might have. But you need to look in the mirror, honey child, juicy fruit, sugar plum. Say hallelujah. 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 Boy, it's quiet in here now. (laughs) And we're not even casting no demons out. Let's go on. The dynamics dynamics of brain and body and and belief is so powerful that when you have faith in God, you love God, it's powerful. Do you know, brothers and sisters, you can take, and forgive me for being so long-winded this morning. It wasn't my intention to be long-winded. But that's how much I care about you. You know, and I wrestle with what I'm going to teach you constantly, but I'm just laying it out there, and I'm hoping I'm helping somebody. Seriously, seriously, because I want to help myself. I got, I got problems too. I got problems just like you do. Okay, I have shortcomings just like you do. So I'm trying to help myself too. Uh, But I will say this, brothers and sisters, that belief, psychologists, even physicians can't figure it out. They've done placebo testing where they gave a person a placebo with a certain sickness and they gave somebody medication. And literally, literally across the board, 50% of the people that took non-medication that they thought they were taking medication had the same results as the other 50% that were taking medication. Because your, your brain, your belief 
Amen? Amen. Therapeutic. The therapy. Just the fact that now I think I'm on a therapy. I'm thinking I'm taking medication. Your brain is so powerful. What you believe in oftentimes will cause your body to heal. That's proven. And I told y'all not long ago about people who had problems with their knees. So they did an experiment. They cut the people, every one of them, 100% of the people, they cut the knees. 50% of them, they did the repair on the knee. 50% they didn't do anything on the knee. They just cut the knee and sewed them back up. They had the same results. The ones that got the knee replacement and repair had the same results as the person that did, didn't have any knee replacement. It's a placebo effect. It's believing. See, they believed that they were helped. They believed. And that's all it took. Their bodies, their brains, their belief gave them power to be healed. Say amen. It defies understanding. But if I can preach the word of God to you and you can put faith in the word of God and you can believe the word of God. It's amazing that empathy, that knowledge of the word of God, what it will do for your life. Say amen. Well, I pray this has been a blessing to you. We, we just need to love God more. Would you stand? Be like those desert dwellers in the spirit taking hallelujah, hallelujah. The battle to the front lines in the spirit. Saying, God, the problem that I have, it could be all these things we talked about, any one of those things we talked about organically, spiritually, but ultimately, God, I've got a heart problem. And that heart problem is there's a lack of love for you. Let us be like those desert dwellers, God. They went out there and put forth effort to their grace. Put forth effort in their life to be victorious. To love you more. To pray more. To draw nearer to you. Not because of merit. To fast more. Because of a love for you, God. Desire to keep the commandments, Lord, because effort doesn't oppose grace in anybody's life. We thank you today, Father. We don't have to be a part of a religious system that's sick and anemic, but we can be a church that has answers that will help people. So, Father, we give you all praise and all glory and all honor. For the word of God today. We thank you for our guest that was here this morning. We thank you for everybody that's here. Every person, individual. That something maybe have been said today. That would help that person. Each one of us today. To love you more. To have a relationship with you God. I don't have to go to a literal desert today Jesus. But I've got to get this message. In my spirit. And in my heart. And everybody said amen. amen. And amen. God bless you for being in the house of God. Uh, tonight. If you come back. I'm going to preach on the genotype. And the prototype. And I'm going to take you into the garden of Eden. I'm going to show you things. About prototype and genotype. That will be a blessing to your life. And it's connected to. The desert dwellers. All right. May the Lord bless you real good. It's my prayer. Have an awesome day. In Jesus' name, you're dismissed.